Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. If I could get everyone to take their seats, please. Great. So welcome, everybody. We have a lot of people here, and that's great to see. Really happy to welcome you here. My name is Maya Romano. I'm the coordinator of GizWatch this year. GizWatch is Global Information Society Watch. It's a publication that the Association for Progressive Communications has been publishing for 13 years now. We decided 13 years. And this year we have a really great subject, artificial intelligence and how it intersects with human rights, social justice and development. I know it's been a hot topic here at IGF, and uh, what we have been trying to do with this year's edition is to really weave in a Global South perspective and to try to give representation to some voices that are often left out of key decision-making processes when it comes to AI. So uh, it's been an absolute privilege jumping into the many worlds and many visions of all of our authors, many of who are present here today, which is really, really great as we celebrate the culmination of these past months of hard work. So we're going to keep our introductions here very brief uh, because we're looking forward to hearing from all the authors. So first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Valeria Betancourt, who's the manager of the Communications and Information Policy Program here at APC. Uh, and uh, she is the manager of the team that is responsible for putting together this report every year. I would also like to introduce Chat Garcia Ramilo, the director of APC, who's going to share with us a few words on uh, APC's work on Watch when we wrap up. I would also like to welcome and thank Article 19 who supported this year's edition of GizWatch, and they were instrumental um, in the direction and actually the theme of this year's edition. Uh, we have with us Mallory Knodel from Article 19. Um, and uh, following at the end of this, the presentations, we're also going to have Vidushi Marda, who will join us, who also contributed a chapter to this report. Um, I also, I'm not sure if we have the technical setup working, but uh, yes, 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 wonderful. So uh, all of our team here and our authors uh, have had the pleasure of working with GizWatch longtime editor, Alan Finley. So we have him uh, connected, I think, via link to say a few words. Alan? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. I'm speaking from a place called Pergamino in Argentina, which is um, in the center of Argentina, about three and a half hours from Buenos Aires. Um, I just wanted to say it was a privilege to work with Gizwatch authors again this year. Many of them I know and have worked with before, and there are many new authors, and that's always um, exciting for me to read uh, the thinking and writing of new authors. Um, Gizwatch is a learning experience. It's an initiation for me. So. Um, I really feel I go through these um, uh, uh, quite profound learning experiences working with the authors, authors. So I'm hoping people read the book, they have the same kind of experience. Um, what struck me most about this year's reports on artificial intelligence is that there was a, an emerging, it seemed to me, undercurrent of resistance. And I mean, I've edited many um, issues of Gizwatch, um, and it seemed different this year. It felt like some authors were taking quite radical positions uh, about saying no to artificial intelligence, intelligence um, and that compromise is not always possible. And it seems to me this is a healthy resistance to what seems to be a new wave of technological determinism and control that is becoming so widely evident. And it feels that this could be something that needs to be thought through more and expanded on. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there for the discussions with you. And, and from my side, I'd like to thank Article 19, Valeria, Maya, and Laurie, um, who have all formed the core editorial and production team of this edition. So it was um, a great experience, and uh, I hope you have a great launch. 
That's wonderful. Thank you, Alan. I'm really glad that worked and that we could hear from you. So um, just to give you a bit of background, in this year's edition of GizWatch, we have 40 country reports, three regional reports, and eight thematic reports. And what's really great is that we have a lot of the authors here present with us. We don't have a huge amount of time, but I would like everybody to speak briefly. So um, we're going to give everybody two minutes, if you could introduce yourself, uh, let us know where you're coming from, and maybe one key takeaway from your report. That would be really, really wonderful. And if we stick to our time limit, and I'm sorry in advance for any strictness, if we stick to the time limit, then we can have a nice discussion afterwards, which would be really great. Um, so what I will do is go through my list, and um, when you need to speak, just hit the button on the microphone, grab one wherever there's one near you, and, uh, and let us know about your research. So we're going to start with the thematic reports, and first up we have Philip Dawson from Element AI. If Phil is here. Thank you, Maya. Great. Um, Thanks, everybody. Um, this, it, was a, it was a great honor to, to uh, work on this uh, short submission for this year's Gizwatch. Uh, I'd like to also just add that I was the second to last to submit. Um, so almost, almost, almost didn't make it in. I think I made some people nervous. Thanks very much, Alan, Maya. Um, I'll keep it brief. I think the, some very, uh, some takeaways from this section of this chapter on data governance with a focus on fiduciary mo models of data governance, in particular data trusts rooted in trust law, is that there's a need to be innovative in looking at how we can transform current ex um, existing approaches to data governance with new models. This chapter looks at some of the legal and governance um, issues related to, to doing that in the context of data trusts in particular. And, and highlights data trust as a possible way to increase uh, agency for people, giving them more control over uh, how their data is used, for what purposes, even giving them um, choice of how their data might be used to champion different social or economic causes. Um, and also d highlights data trusts as, um, as doing something that existing comprehensive data protection legislation does not do currently, which is a, a, to, to provide a collective act action mechanism uh, for, for people to exercise their rights jointly and to exert more leverage against large uh, data controllers uh, and, or collectors. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. It's a short chapter and encourage you uh, all to take a look. Um, and be happy to, to chat with you going forward uh, today or in the future about, uh, about the topic. Thank you. Great, thanks, Phil. Next up, we have Luis Fernando Garcia Munoz from Derechos Digitales. I'm sorry, from what? R3D. R3D. Yes, it, we, we have in our name Derechos Digitales as well, but it's longer. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to write this article and, and uh, to contribute to this edition of Guess Watch. Um, I'm Luis Fernando Garcia from an NGO called A3D, Digital Rights Defense Network from Mexico. And I, was, uh, I wrote about a very helicopter view of the ways in which AI has been, it's been used um, around the world. Sometimes AI is pictured as a technology that is going to be in the future be applied uh, but the reality is that this is already being applied in many places um, and having direct effects in the enjoyment of human rights. In the chapter, um, I, as I mentioned, do a very helicopter view, very rapid uh, summary of some of the main issues, for example, predictive policing, uh, facial recognition, uh, surveillance, uh, massive surveillance, um, but also other types of implementations of AI that directly uh, are used to police people. The, 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 the title is Policing People, Streets or, and Speech. It focuses a little bit uh, also on the intersection between these systems and the right to protest, uh, but also the right to freedom of expression as um, AI systems are increasingly being utilized to police speech online. So there's also an exploration about, about that. But if you want to learn more, just read it. And I think that gives you a brief summary of what you will find in that article. 
Thank you. Thank you, Luis, that's great. So next we have uh, Joana Varon from Coding Rights, as well as Paz Peña, who together wrote a chapter. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Joana Varon from Coding Rights. Paz, I think, is not here. Yeah, no. Um, so our chapter was called Decolonizing AI, a transfeminist approach to data and social justice. Um, it's uh, an outcome of uh, research that we are doing, a bigger one, uh, in which we are mapping AI projects uh, from the public sector in Latin America and try, try to um, see which ones are likely to have gender implications. For that chapter specifically, we analyzed uh, the case of uh, AI being used for predicting pregnancy in, uh, in teenagers in, in the city of Salta. The project is being exported to other countries as well, from Argentina to Brazil to Colombia. So our goal in the chapter was to go beyond human rights uh, approaches to analyze AI, uh, have, uh, having also feminist lenses to analyze an AI project. And by that, I mean, um, having a more uh, a view that includes also considering power relations and not just the liberal vision of human rights that uh, focus only in the individual uh, is capable to protect its, its uh, rights. This is also a continuation of a work that Paz and I started on discussing consent, bringing the the feminist theories around consent to discuss consent to our data and to our data bodies. And, and the idea is to uh, have other values, other transfeminist values, map what are those and think, can we also have a, trans, a transfeminist framework to analyze AI systems? Um, for doing that, in parallel, we are doing this game at Coding Rights, but in partnership with uh, my colleague Sasha Constanza from the MIT, in we, that we call an oracle for transfeminist futures, in which we departure from transfeminist values such as intersectionality, intuition, queerness, autonomy, decentralization, non-binary, and try to envision what are the transfeminist technologies that we want? So all this work goes uh, hand by hand and is a bit explained in the chapter. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next we have Nandini Chami from IT for Change. Thank you, Maya. It's like wonderful to be with all of you here today. So uh, our chapter from IT for Change is a thematic report and, the and, and it's called Radicalizing the AI Governance Agenda. So what the chapter does is to take stock of the broad trends in three strands of AI governance debates we see today, which are AI and human rights, AI and the future of work, and AI, democracy, and the automated public sphere. And our one main critical finding is that most of the governance debates tend to circle around very liberalist solutions which means that the whole focus is on correcting wrongs of misrecognition, and there's hardly any attention to linking the AI debate with the political economy of data ownership and control, and the injustice of data extractivism and what it means for development for economies of the global south. So I encourage you to read the chapter, and also, if possible, you could check out the booth of the JustNet Coalition where we could have a conversation around that as well. Great, thank you. And uh, wrapping up the thematic reports, we have Alex Komninos from Research ICT Africa. Hi, um, I wrote the report with a colleague, Grace Mutungu, and uh, a associate that we met at the Deep Learning in Daba in Nairobi. Um, Grace is a lawyer, and, and Emily uh, Muller is a mathematician at Imperial College London. Um, so it was a convergence of perspectives, and there's three things I want to briefly talk about in the article. Uh, the first is I, I, th I think that I, I was less critical than I, I usually am about tech. I'm, I'm not a solutionist, but my, 
mind has been opened a bit as to what's possible. And there's a lot of interesting hap stuff happening in Africa by Africans and yeah, uh, anyone can, well not anyone, but you, AI is, is, is democratized in many ways. There's, there's open science behind it. The algorithms that we all talk about existing behind the black box before they're compiled, they're, they're open source and I was pleasantly surprised by the community which I think can be good for development. So um, to, I gave the publication, at, we gave the publication team at, at um, APC a bit of a headache because we did a table here with all of the examples of AI 4D uh, and then some, some challenges. Um, what I would like you all to do is to, to read this in a year's time, maybe with a pen, and s cross some stuff out and say, that was hype, that was bullshit. Um, because, yeah, uh, AI is subject to a hype cycle and, and solutionism that we must be aware of. It's easy to say, oh, we've got this great project. Uh, second thing is there's immense potential for AI for development and human development. I, I think the first and obvious one is health, and I'm not going to go into it, look at the table. But, um, and then this is an argument by Lynette Taylor and Dennis Bruders and, and others. Um, there's, there's, there's two things happening. The first is datafication. So increasing aspects of our lives are being datafied, uh, especially the poor. And then the second is a lot of AI happens around public and private partnerships. So there's power shifts in development that are happening at this moment, and, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's augmenting the power of the private sector, and it's, it's changing discourses. It's something we must be very careful about. Uh, I think it's something that may have happened at earlier stages in development with the statistical revolution, so there might be some historical learnings there. And yeah, I think, uh, lastly, so um, I, my perspective is I'm distrustful of technology, I like my privacy, etc. but AI can, or big data, it, it can make the poor visible and it can make the poor vulnerable. So um, there's a dystop, we took digital ID D as an example and there's dystopian fears around digital ID, but ID makes you visible and read by the state. So if you want to get access to social services, um, it, if you want to do a whole factor of things, like your ID is very important. So while we must be very critical of that, it's, it's a human right that someone should have an ID and it should be enabling. Um, and then secondly, yeah, uh, there's the power structures in international development and um, why we get you know, companies like Palantir working with the World Food Program. And I think this is to do with the needs that are existing around development as well as the power structures around AI. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Alex. So we're gonna move now into the country and regional reports. So we'll get those started off with Florencia Roveri from Argentina. Hello everybody. Thank you, uh, Maya. Um, we focused our report on unions perception, perceptions of artificial intelligence. Um, not only about uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, artificial intelligence changes processes of work, but also um, it insights in, in statistics. So we, we consult several unions in Argentina, uh, in our city in Rosario, um, about uh, how they are perceiving artificial intelligence. Um, we also include in the, in the chapter uh, the experience of um, a union created for workers in platforms, uh, also related to how they deal with aspects of artificial intelligence, and um, also uh, mentioned uh, a, a section uh, uh, that we call from uh, gaps to bias to, uh, to uh, develop uh, an aspect related to gender, how is it that the gap gender uh, is um, mentioned as a bias uh, when we thought about uh, the application of uh, resources related to artificial intelligence in the works um, uh, places? Uh, what we found is that uh, unions uh, are worried about these aspects, but uh, they assume that they are not uh, 
assuming it as a central problem because they are in our context of developed countries are uh, mostly worried about other aspects of labor conditions. But they thought they are, they, there is a, ch a challenging aspect in uh, deepening in the consideration of these technological aspects uh, in the workplaces of all the fields we, we work with. We, we interviewed people from unions related to bank workers, with public workers, and also from, from the commerce field. So thank you. Great, thank you. Next, do we have Mariana Canto from Brazil? Hi, uh, I'd like to thank you for the space, firstly. Uh, I'm Mariana Canto from Brazil, from the EPHEC, which is an institute for research on law and technology in Brazil. We are based in Recife, which is a city on the northeast. And currently, we are developing studies on, on the investigation of surveillance systems that are being used by the state, but also with the use of facial recognition in public schools. And my, my report was more into those kind of approach and the public schools approach, because it's not really well spotted by the media nowadays there. And during my report, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the system works and what kind of data is collecting from minors in schools such as biometric and health data and about the risks and how this is being non-regulated by, by the state even though we have a data protection regulation at the moment. Um, I'm also going to talk about a little bit of how our principle of data minimization is not being followed and how we are not thinking and the state is not thinking of less intrusive ways to reach social problems and social uh, insecurities in the country. Uh, it's important to mention that after the report was uh, sent, uh, a really important and really similar case happened in the Sweden and it was the first fine, um, um, it was the first time the Data Protection Authority of Sweden fined the, a public school in Sweden and for the same system because they were using facial recognition in the place of uh, the role for attendance call. And it was a 20,000 euro fine and it, this is important also to mention. And all the facial recognition systems in Brazil uh, such as to public surveillance, to mass surveillance, to public transportation and other public spaces are not, ha they don't have any kind of human rights uh, impact assessment or anything doing uh, prior to its use. It's only implemented with uh, poor disclosure of how the system works and which kind of data is collecting or any of those informations are not public. So I hope uh, you enjoy the reading. Great, thank you. Next, we're going to uh, have Raymond Onuoha, who wrote the Africa Regional Report. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the opportunity to contribute uh, to that thoughtful project. Uh, for my own research, I focused on the Africa region with regards to harmonizing data protection and privacy policies. I think it's on page 59, if you can go through the report, and considering the continuous shift in connectivities and the multilateral requirements for the cross-border nature of data at this moment, uh, acting in silos with regards to dealing with the issues or the threats of data protection and privacy uh, is beginning to shift away from the traditional uh, siloed national country perspectives to a more transnational and multilateral approach. And therefore, there is a need for a harmonized data protection framework for the continent. Issues that we are raised, why this has not gained traction, include uh, the engagement process, the top-down engagement processes within the African Union that has uh, necessitated a low adoption of the 2014 African Union Convention on Data Protection and Cyber, uh, Cyber Security, and that has led to a lack of uh, ratified members at the moment, only about uh, 15 countries out of the 55 member countries of the AU have signed up to that instrument, with only five having ratified it. And the document, the instrument for it to go 
to uh, full enforcement and compliance requires at least 15 ratifications. So there's still a whole long way to go. Without these instruments at the regional level, the region lacks the capacity to hold uh, data, uh, the big data companies accountable as Europe is doing at the moment, and that becomes very significant considering even uh, the economic perspectives with regards to a shift towards the African Continental Trade Agreement era and regime, and that becomes very important for member countries not just to reassess uh, the traditional instruments, considering the new perspectives that and risk that AI brings with these increased deplo uh, increasing deployments across the region, but also to ratify that instrument and, also, and, and again enforce and make sure there is a compliance, especially for these data firms that at the last count, none of them are registered as a business within the continent. And therefore, there must be some enforcement mechanisms that should be put in place, regardless of whether they are registered or not. They have to sign up to those instruments so that we can not just maximize the benefits of data with increasing connectivity that AI brings, but also minimize the threats uh, across the region. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next, we have Irene Potranto from Canada. Uh, thank you, Maya. Uh, my name is Irene Potranto with the Citizen Lab. I'm a co-author of the report on Canada together with Petra Molnar and Victoria Heath, also at the University of Toronto. It was our pleasure to contribute to this edition of the GIS Watch and to be here today with all of you. Thank you again to Maya and Alan for all of your hard work. Uh, our, chap our chapter is entitled Feminist or Not, Canada's Challenges as it Raises to Become a Leader in AI. So Canada, under the Trudeau government, declared itself as a feminist government in 2015, while also committed to being a key player in artificial intelligence. In our chapter, we call on the Canadian government, as well as other governments who are keen on using automated decision-making systems to ensure diversity and proper impact assessments, to ensure that the benefits of new technologies like AI will accrue equally. So I'll end there. Thank you very much, and I hope you'll enjoy reading it. Thanks, Irene. That's great. Next, we have Juan Diego Castaneda Gomez from Colombia. Though it appears he might not be here. Oh, there you are. Okay, let's get him a microphone. Um, thank you all, and we um, thank you for the opportunity for what uh, for writing in this uh, version of the report. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about a specific project uh, developed by the Constitutional Court in Colombia, and our point was uh, the kind of discourse that went around AI, because we have to face the situation in which we don't have like actual deployment of AI. So uh, the point we're uh, basically talking about how uh, the discourse and the charisma of the technologies make a great way into the development of these technologies and they um, foreshadow and they uh, put in the background some discussions, some political discussion, specifically our case in Colombia was an AI system deployed that they want to deploy to um, help the constitutional court decide which kind of cases are going to get selected. So uh, our point uh, with, the, with our participation or contribution in the report is to talk about how um, during the development and the design of the system, it is not taken into account many of the design problems and it is not placed this technology and AI system into the bigger picture of the role and the work of the Constitutional Court uh, and the work of the judges from the very local places to the Constitutional Court. So this kind of design and this um, broader consideration of how it's uh, supposed to work, uh, it's not taken uh, into consideration in the design. So um, there, uh, it, it closes the opportunity for the political discussion of how to employ AI. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Next we have Maria Jose Calderon from Ecuador. Hi, my name is Maria Jose. I'm ha very happy to be part of this, of this edition. Our research um, dealt with the use of social media and artificial intelligence with da data mining and how it is dangerously used to undermine democracy. We take into account um, the, our, legal, our country's legal framework and basically when voting is mandatory, 
This reduces a lot any options of, of guessing or, or you know, deliberately manipulating political discourse and, and, how it's, and the outcome of an election. This happened in this 2019 election. And we just, you know, it's like a, mostly it's like a cautionary tale of what will happen if we don't take into account um, legal inst and institutional frameworks in other countries with the use of AI. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Up next, we have Anulek Anandi from India. Hi, um, so I'm Anulek Anandi. I work with the Digital Empowerment Foundation in India. And for our report, we um, focused on the application of AI in India's pub in public education sector, particularly focusing on the case of uh, state in South India, Andhra Pradesh. And um, what we realized when AI is mainstreamed in um, social sectors, it is done through public-private partnerships. And uh, what was necessary in the case of public-private partnerships was the lack of transparency in the agreements about which kind of data sets were used, how they were stored, um, and um, how they were handled, especially since it led, uh, since uh, it was data pertaining to underserved and marginalized communities. And one of the probably call to actions would be that there is greater transparency in public-private partnership agreements. Um, uh, so thank you, that's all for me, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kemli Camacho from Costa Rica. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you. I'm um, uh, one of the co-author of this uh, His Watch uh, report from Costa Rica. We work it around the uh, intelligent artificial and uh, the right to health. And we specifically analyze the universal health data record that we have in Costa Rica, where all the data around health and uh, history of the families and health history of the families is integrated in one, one uh, only one uh, database. Then uh, we discuss with the health system in Costa Rica about the, the pros and cons uh, to use intelligent artificial with these uh, national data is uh, maybe one of the most uh, tr important treasure of information in our country. And um, uh, of course, uh, for the right to health, using uh, intelligence artificial, for instance, to define in the future uh, the, the future infrastructure. This is this is some of the uses that they are they are doing at the moment. Uh, define the future infrastructure. How the infrastructure, the health infrastructure, have to be built uh, to prevent uh, the the future illness like mental health. But on the other side. For instance, the health uh, workers are very worried about how they are going to work uh, with int intelligent artificial conclusions or how they are going to work with robots at the same time than, than uh, human uh, services. And also, um, uh, we discuss a lot with the, we, we had the opportunity uh, writing this uh, chapter uh, to discuss a lot with the, with the health workers also, and especially with the informatic departments of health system about uh, the, the data, and because at this moment there are no policy, no processes to protect these databases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kemli. Next we have Giacomo Mazzone from Italy. Thank you very much. Um, this was a collective work because I used um, collective wisdom with other colleagues that um, helped me in the work, so I want to thank them. Um, I think that the contribution from Italy is mainly focusing on uh, media because this is the, the sector where we are active, um, but also on policy because on both, I think, I think that there are, we have interesting examples to study. The most interesting for me is the femicide uh, storytelling that is um, a combination of database um, of news 
with database of criminal records about all the crimes that have been committed against women in Italy in the last years. Um, this um, data bank has been made by uni the, possible by the cooperation with university and media and um, is aimed to try to predict the cases where this could happen again and try to uh, help the, assist, uh, the Center for Assistance against um, uh, crimes and violence against women. Um, the second interesting example that um, I cherry-picked is about the use of artificial intelligence for um, creating support for accessibility. Uh, there is, um, it's very interesting and very promising. I, I suggest you to have a look at it if you can, because using artificial intelligence is possible to create tools to make accessible media at very low cost. For instance, it has been created a, a, a tool that make automatic translation of programs into sign languages, of course in Italian, because this was aimed to the Italian um, public, but can be easily adapted to any other part of the world. And this make possible to access for impaired people to programs that usually they are TV, radio, or even written text accessible in, in, in a very easy way. Uh, the last point on policies. Uh, there, is, mm, there has been uh, one of the first laboratories in Europe uh, trying to uh, convince the platform to test the mm, self-regulation of the platforms on wh when it comes to hate speech and uh, fake news, etc., etc. And mm, the regulatory authority of Italy for media that is called AGICOM uh, created a table where all these platforms are presented with traditional media, trying to set up some uh, minimum thresholds uh, of in involvement. And this has been tested recently during the Italian, uh, the European election in Italy, and um, worked quite well in trying to limit the phenomenon. Of course, our only path, we don't know where it will go, but uh, our interesting path to be studied for others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, could we have Miru from Republic of Korea, please? Hello, um, this is Miru, and I'm from Republic of Korea. And we, our report is focusing on the personal data protections. Um, because in order to make successful machine learning, especially for the new product and service, public or private, needs to lots of information to training the AI systems. So personal data in that case is wonderful resource for that. Therefore, there are a huge stream to change the personal data protection law in Korea to be more companies friendly. They want to sell the identified customer information, personal data, and credit information, such as record where you're using your credit card, how much you spend, when you stop buying the supermarket, and all those things. And they try to combine that information with your uh, cell phone information. In that case, especially in Korea, the cell phone directly linked your name and Registration numbers in Koreans. So that is a huge problem. But in that case, they didn't get the consent from the data, data subject at all. In order, to, in order to fight for that, to protect people's privacy, Jimbonet is working hard even for now. And we are writing about that in our reports. Uh, in this report, I wrote about current law system in Korea and new law system, how governments and company want to change it, just briefly. So if you have any question about that, please contact me anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have Arzak Khan from Pakistan here? Looks like he didn't make it. Okay, uh, next we have Casey James from Panama. Hola a todos, espero que estén bien. I just wanted to say hi in Spanish because I'm representing Panama. <laughs> well, my name is Casey James and I'm really happy to be representing Ipandetec. We are a nonprofit organization and we regulate digital rights. So we're also very happy because it's the fourth time we are being represented on the Guest Watch 
And this year's report, we have presented it with the title, Artificial Intelligence in Panama, the Prototype Phase. Why prototype phase? Because that's how we are right now in artificial intelligence in Panama. So we divided this report in four stages to get to know if we are ready or not for these changes in artificial intelligence. Also, we spoke about how artificial intelligence is entering into finance, into health, into education, and then we present which is the prototype phase in which we are working right now in Panama. Today is the 28th of November, and it's a very special day in my country because we are celebrating our independence from Spain. But also, it's a very important day for us because we have been placed on the map with this report that Gizwash gave us the opportunity to present. So we are really happy and we are really proud and we thank Maya and Alan for all their support and all their help and all their patience with us and also thank all of the other authors who send us messages with interesting topics that made us learn a little bit more about this um, topic. and. On behalf of my country and my organization and the four million people I'm representing here today, thank you so much. And well, you can find us in page 188 and you can read our report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Casey. That was great. Do we have Rachel Adams from South Africa here? Hi, um, good afternoon everyone. It's so lovely to be here and I'm just so excited to read so many of these fascinating reports that also encompass so many critical dimensions to, um, to AI. So our chapter um, that was written <coughs> together with two colleagues of mine at the Human Sciences Research Council, Sahir Parker and Paul Platinga, it looks at the use of AI in local government in South Africa to promote responsive local governance. As, uh, as I think Alex said earlier, there's, there's a huge kind of discourse and hype around AI. And at the moment, this is just an online platform where registers, uh, use, users can register to pose queries to government representatives about public services and they will respond. But the idea is that this will become all automated and it will become a chatbot that will be able to respond to you about government issues in an automated way. But the whole sort of idea around it was that instantaneously 16 million people living in South Africa will have instantaneous access to government services, which is huge for a country where so many of the populations um, are in rural areas that are quite far removed from government resources um, and, and the cities where so many of these services um, lie. So the idea was to promote access to government services, particularly for these people. But of course, it relies on this sort of fundamental idea that everyone has access to the internet, which is you know, one of the first things that, that we critiqued. There's quite a um, relatively low internet penetration in South Africa of just over 60%. And those people that don't have the internet are those in the rural communities that this very service is, tar is targeted to. There's also questions around a growing gender digital divide that's quite worrying. And then the other thing is that this um, service, which is called GovChat, is being promoted only in the English language, which with 11 official languages in South Africa, this really limits access for a wide range of people. So. Yeah, you can read more, I don't know what page it's on, <laughs> but towards the end of, um, of the report on South Africa's experience with this. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Next we have Gurkan Osturan from Turkey. So, hi. Happy to be here in Berlin again. And uh, today I'm representing Hun Consultancy. But uh, I'm also the executive manager of uh, Dokuzate News that is operating in Turkey. And the report is about uh, partly about the new media organization that I'm leading as well. So the original idea uh, was to 
write a report actually on a much different topic, not quite different than the one uh, that ended up to be, but uh, on the road of uh, writing this report, we have come across an obstacle, and that was that we have been shut down by Twitter uh, ahead of the elections. And uh, this report is now focusing on the takedown notices uh, ordered by Twitter ahead of the elections targeting independent media in Turkey. As uh, most of you might know, the media in Turkey has been suffocating for over a decade now and has been experiencing terrible developments. And digital media has become the basis for uh, any critical opinion. And uh, the 50% that does not uh, support the current uh, governing alliance in Turkey is uh, heavily relying on digital atmosphere. So originally, the plan was to write a report on how uh, AI is being used to manipulate the content flow on uh, digital platforms and how uh, news consumers, news readers are being presented with uh, subverted facts and information. And in the end, uh, it ended up to be focusing on a much more, uh, a much harsher method that was used to manipulate the content flow online. And uh, as a result, uh, we have come up with uh, several action steps uh, addressing the global uh, uh, media associations and free expression uh, collectives to promote uh, further transnational uh, network alliances among media, uh, media organizations and also to uh, sit down and talk with uh, social media giants like Twitter and Facebook and then to promote uh, these digital media platforms uh, as valid sources of information. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Next, we have Daniel Moisinga from Uganda. Thank you very much. I'm Daniel Moisinga from CIPESA, an ICT policy research organization based in Kampala, Uganda. So in, 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 in this very short article that I had very many words for, I basically looked at um, the core aspects of surveillance application in the public, private, and the humanitarian sectors. In Uganda, um, the deployment and expected the deployment of AI has been shrouded in a secrecy and mostly opaque agreements between actors. So in this uh, very brief report, I look at the recent deployment of facial recognition uh, that actually started recently um, by Huawei and the government of Uganda. I look, up, I look at um, the deployment of um, uh, deep learning by MTN, which is the largest telco in Africa, in conjunction with IBM uh, through credit, alternative credit scoring models, and also look at a radio content analysis tool deployed by the UNDP, uh, Pass Lab in Kampala. So the major argument here is to uh, provoke the author, uh, provoke the reader to think about the alternative ways or the biases and, um, and the potential abuses of data that could emerge out of these three uh, overarching themes. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Maria Korokova from Ukraine. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you, Maya and Alan, for your wonderful and careful editing. Um, in my report on Ukraine, I focus on uh, quite recent uh, developments in, in Ukraine um, in the sphere of AI and in social sphere as well. On the recent um, election of 2019, April, when the newly elected government uh, decided to put AI at the forefront of um, its innovations and um, and I even quote its new president, Volodymyr Zelensky, that artificial intelligence should replace uh, the mentality of officials, but by which he probably meant the corrupted mentality. So um, in that case, I sort of wonder how uh, Ukrainian government is using AI as a metaphor and as a political sort of campaigning tool. And I outlined several, while, while sort of welcoming this development from a, the progressive point of view, I outlined several um, cautious and recommendations how to make it um, properly. Thank you. Thank you. And now I just want to ask and make sure that we didn't miss anybody. Do we have any other authors here or anybody who would like to speak on behalf of their organization? May not be on my list. Just stick your hand up. I just want to make sure everybody's included. Go 
Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for uh, all of your comments. Um, I also want to thank Alai, who uh, did a wonderful translation into Spanish of a number of the Latin American articles, which uh, we also have available here. Um, and uh, Sally, would you like to make a comment? Um, yes, Alai is the Latin American Information Agency based in Ecuador, and we have a periodical publication called America Latina in Movimiento. This is the second, we have a long relationship with APC, and this is the second co-edition we've brought out of an abbreviated version um, of the Giz Watch, which is, which is here, and I think there's some copies available here. Um, just very briefly, um, uh, well, it's a publication that already has a wide audience in Latin America. Uh, we have a print and a uh, freely available online digital version. Um, so as we have space restrictions, we took, um, we made abbreviated versions, translations of three of the uh, framing articles and three of the Latin American uh, reports on Argentina, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Um, I think we hope it will be a contribution to the debate in the region on these issues, which are as yet not very visible. Um, people uh, are often not aware of what's happening. Even the people who are, who are being helped or who are victims of uh, these artificial intelligence programs aren't always aware of what the issues are and what's, what's going on behind them. So we hope it's a contribution to that. And uh, thanks for ABC for the for the opportunity. Uh, you can find it online at our website, alinet.org, and I imagine there's a link on the APC site as well. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sally. We appreciate it. Uh, and last, I think we have some representatives from Hemley that wanted to make a statement. If we could maybe make room at a microphone. Hi. I, I hope this is the appropriate time, because I wasn't sure as we Sorry. weren't authors. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Um, so I wasn't sure because we weren't authors if this was the appropriate time. So is it, yes, to contribute? Sure, go ahead. We're going to go into questions soon, so uh, feel free to add your commentary. For sure. Okay, so, um, so in regards to artificial intelligence, okay, so we're Hamla, we're the Arab Center for the Advancement of Social Media. Uh, we work on Palestinian digital rights. Um, and particularly for us, um, facial recognition technology uh, <coughs> and artificial intelligence and how it's being used on po uh, products are being developed using Palestinian uh, private information and sold to companies around the world as well as exported to governments known to violate human rights. Uh, we see this as a critical thing and are really happy to see the full room here. Um, so, I don't know how much time I'm allocated. Two minutes, preferably. Two yeah. minutes. Okay. So, yes. So, you can see, you know, um, okay, so some key thing to talk about in two minutes. <laughs> I think I summed it up. You can read a lot about it in the Any Vision. Okay, the most recent thing for, I will just give an example of a successful strategy recently to approach this issue. Um, uh, there's an Israeli company called AnyVision, which has been using, uh, ha whose technology and their relationship with the IDF enabled them to create facial recognition technology uh, throughout the West Bank. Um, and Microsoft has recently invested in them, uh, $78 million. And even though we, as civil society, advocated and told them about these rights violations, and they seemed to be very clear to us, it was only through work with activists and investigative journalists at NBC we were able to get any response from the company itself. And now they have launched an investigation and hired Eric Holder to do the uh, review of the Israeli company. So you can see that the length of work and the way you have to do it to get things done is not necessarily happening at IGF in some ways, but beyond that. Um, yeah, and we look to see how forums like this and engagement on many different levels beyond IGF can create impact in the way I think many people here want to see it. Thank you. 
Thanks, Alison. That's really great. Thank you, everybody. And also, I just want to point out a big thanks to the authors who couldn't be here today, but who also contributed excellent, excellent chapters to this report. Uh, before we jump into the questions, I would like to turn it over to my colleague Valeria to uh, give a few comments on Giz. Oopsie. <laughs> on Giz Watch. We're having technical difficulties <laughs> online in a moment. I know the, sh the cable is too short. Okay, so thank you so much, Maya. Uh, I just want to share a couple of uh, details about, about Gizwatch because it might not be uh, familiar for all of you how Gizwatch was conceived. And the Global Information Society Watch uh, has been since 2007 a tool and a process for collective reflection um, of the implementation of the um, WSIS commitments, particularly the commitments by, by, uh, made by governments in relation to how we are creating um, inclusive democratic information societies. So it has been conceived as a platform that really provides uh, critical civil society perspectives uh, around specific issues that are relevant uh, in different contexts, but also proposes very uh, specific action uh, steps. And this is part of the value that Gizwatch brings. Uh, so uh, some action uh, steps towards deepening democracy, towards uh, putting and bringing human rights to the forefront, and uh, uh, towards working uh, towards social justice. So that is, we believe, the value uh, of, of Gizwatch, part of the value of Gizwatch. And also, um, uh, we are convinced that there is no other publication that has been addressing uh, from the Global South, with voices from the Global South, in such consistent way, uh, with uh, such a breadth of you know, the spectrum of issues, uh, uh, the evolution of issues that are relevant for the information society, but, uh, but particularly bringing an advocacy perspective. So this is also uh, another important aspect of, of Gizwatch. And this year we have, we have had the fortune to work in collaboration with Article 19 on an issue that is of common interest. And it has enriched the process very much. It, it has been a pleasure to work with the, uh, the Article 19 team. And um, we are convinced that this joint effort has resulted not only in a, a quite interesting and valuable learning exercise about what is uh, the, the contextual impact of artificial intelligence, but also we feel that it will result, uh, result in providing some significant input for um, doing some um, research-based advocacy, but also for providing some specific and alternative responses, technical responses, policy responses, um, to um, artificial intelligence issues. So thank you for that collaboration, Mallory, and we hope that we, you enjoy reading the book, that you find it useful and relevant for your context, and please be mindful of the action steps. I, I cannot emphasize this enough, that we really expect this to, to inform um, um, advocacy actions in your particular context. So just to thank uh, uh, the authors and Article 19 and, the, and Maya and Alan and all the APC team, um, we really uh, feel this is a, a good contribution in a very timely way in which um, human rights obviously are being pushed back in different ways. So we hope that this also strengthens uh, the possibilities to come up with the viable responses to um, strengthen the exercise of human rights. So thank you. Thank you, Valeria, that's great. So we're actually doing really well for time. I'm really happy about that. So I would like to open it up to all of you to talk with each other, to ask your questions, and I will moderate as best as I can. Does anybody out there have any questions? We're all feeling pretty good about AI in here, apparently. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was uh, uh, hearing that, uh, yes, this is the report, and now read it, and let's come together in a year's time. Um, I was wondering um, why there is no effort, or maybe I ignore it, 
uh, to create a dynamic coalition which deals with artificial intelligence and its challenges. I was involved at the time in creating the dynamic coalition on internet rights and principles, and I think over the years a lot of good work has been done in that context. Here I can see that there is a lot of capable people who maybe would like to continue their work uh, during the sessions. And therefore my question is, is there such an initiative already? And if not, uh, should it be? I think it's a great idea, obviously. I think there has been some attempts to address these and other issues, but I think that's the, also the, the beauty of a process that is open, such as the IGF, to be able to propose um, the creation of and using the structures that the IGF is providing to actually address one issue. But maybe Henriette can help us to <laughs> address. There isn't. Yes. There was a best practice forum on artificial intelligence and Internet of Things, but that's different. I think Wolfgang is um, correct to point to that being a gap, and if there's an interest in that, then form a dynamic coalition <laughs> and make it work really, really well. Does anybody else have another question, comment? Um, um, to all the authors, but when you were looking at, 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 at policy interventions and, and the, the required policy and regulatory interventions, where do you think they need to come from? Do they need to be nationally driven? Is there a need for global standards? Um, where, where does one start this process of creating a, 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 a policy and regulatory environment that, that, that can ensure that, that, that the concerns that have been identified are addressed? Is, so just, just, or is it an industry? Is it, is it working, you know, do you focus on, on regulating industry? So I just want to get a sense of where you think the leverage is. Where do we start with our interventions? Thanks, Henriette. I think we have, uh, Alex, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just one sentence. I would say it's quite frustrating for people who've been involved in ICT policy, ICT development for like decades. Suddenly AI comes, it's hypey now, there's a thing called the AI effect in like a year or two, we're just gonna call it computing or ICTs. So let's actually look at national legislations and see where, what's there, see where we can build capacity and also look at international law. And yeah, it definitely has to be regulated as AI in certain contexts, but let's not reinvent the wheel and let's not lose what we've built. Did you wanna speak here? Thank you. And we had uh, somebody else wanted to, yes, go ahead. I just want to share with you an, an experience at the European level. Um, there has been uh, regulation uh, that has been decided at the EU level on copyright, that is very controversial, as you know, but it's been decided, and one country decided to immediately apply it, and one platform decided not to obey to the law. Simply they said, okay, we don't agree with that. If you want us to apply this law, then we will disconnect all the media that will ask to apply the law. So at least you need a regional level to be enough big to reply to the kind of retaliation that you, can, you are exposed when you do regulation. Thanks, Giacomo. I think we've got Joanna, Kurkan, and Daniel that I see. Sure. Henriette, hello. Uh, difficult question, but uh, I, the answer I think is multi-layered. But just to think about some cases, like for, for the case that we analyzed, it's a project that was uh, done uh, with Microsoft, and that's exactly why it's being exported to the region. So um, going directly to the companies, or even to who is funding those projects, like the 
Inter-American Bank of Development is now uh, discussing, like I'm part of a working group in there, where we are discussing like what do you need to consider for not funding a particular project on AI. Um, and for me now in Brazil, it's gonna be very hard to push against some projects on AI because our government it's far right. So anything on facial recognition doesn't matter our argument, our rationale. Uh, they are going to be a pro imprisonment, pro discrimination. So sometimes, like the national level, of course, it's important, and we need to have our regulations. But uh, putting pressure in the companies that are bringing those technologies and um, through the international scenario, I think it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. So in terms of uh, legislating the, or regulating the AI field, coming from Turkey, for me, it is a huge threat to see any national government in charge of its own uh, AI implementation. And seeing that uh, our government in Turkey is preparing to nationalize the digital space uh, with inside Turkey, this is bringing up a lot of uh, risk points and red alerts uh, for me personally. So in that aspect, no government, uh, including the best governments, uh, should be trusted with uh, any such legislation alone. And then uh, for several years, uh, for over a decade, it has been argued that multi-stakeholder policy is uh, working for its way. So bringing in government officials, uh, private sector, and then civil society, etc., all these uh, different groups. But even then, the governments can create their cronies. They can create pro-government associations and NGOs. So they can claim to be multi-stakeholder, but will this be pluralistic enough? So uh, I do not have a solution but I see a lot of red flags uh, popping up everywhere. That's great. Uh, we have Daniel, and then I think there's a question on the side. Uh, thanks, Andrea, for the question and, uh, and the comment earlier. So speaking from a Global South, in particular, uh, Ugandan perspective, I think it's also much layered and even more complex, uh, because first we must assume that we're not uh, operating under mature kind of democratic systems, and also, not uh, operating under guaranteed human rights frameworks. A quick point of reference. So the deployment of facial recognition uh, in Kampala, which is the capital city of Uganda, coincided the passage of the data protection and privacy law. So how do you enable facial recognition then also pass something that's there to guarantee the rights? And yet, effectively, we're seeing uh, the movement of, of the government to nationalize and centralize the internet but then also clamping hard on dissent. So uh, my, my proposal would be in this case, again, not entirely leaving this to government because they've found the loopholes anyway, but to maybe bind them into a bit of regional or even you know, continent-specific kind of laws that, are, that, that, that not only offer the, 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 the benchmarks, but also ca uh, kind of can be applied in the specific context. Thank you. Thank you. And we had a question. Yes, go ahead. If you wouldn't mind just stepping up to a microphone. There we go. Thanks. Now, it's, just, it's not a question, just a response to Henriette. Uh, from my own observation and from the research that I carried out even in this project, what I found out is that uh, the national contest remain the basic sovereign entities if we are talking about actual implementation of these laws. So why regional or global frameworks are critical in terms of having a harmonized system that can engender uh, the implementation of these frameworks, the national still remains the basic units because if there are no national laws or regulatory principles in place already, there won't be that capacity and there won't be any instruments that you can even use to say, okay, this is what we have and so how can we harmonize together uh, to, to have a more robust uh, implementation capacity across the transnational boundaries. So it remains basic that we should start at the national level and then we can progress 
to harmonize at regional or global levels. But without that, uh, it will lack the foundational structures for actual implementation. And then for a, uh, an institutional framework that looks promising based on the research I've carried out is the co-regulatory model. Uh, by that, you are, you are not just leaving the burden of developing standards and technical principles to the government or the policy echelon that lack that capacity. But you can rely on the civil society, integrated with the technical community, integrated with the private sector, to form that technical basis for making standard, standards and principles with regards to these technical developments. But this must be based on the legislations and the policy frameworks that are driven by the governments. And so in such a way, you have that co-regulatory framework that can work. It makes it easier for implementation if these standards are developed by those who are regulated, but also does not leave them to the whims and, capri and caprices of self-regulation self if the government laws and policies are used to bear them up in a proper foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments? Uh, I see one at the back and one at the side here. Go ahead. Uh, Anupam Guha, Center for Policy Studies, IIT Bombay, India. I'm an AI policy person. So uh, a bit of a, a bit of a contradiction we are hearing about uh, national sovereignty versus rights, but like one kind of rights that often get uh, sort of erased in these conversations is the right of equity. So what we are seeing with transnational AI systems and value chains is that there has been a steady change in how labor and work operates, especially in countries of Global South. And what we are seeing are new forms of precariat work which are uh, now emerging in uh, certain economies and there is not a lot of conversation around capital, wealth flows, etc. There is another aspect to this, this kind of extractivism, which is that um, AI systems and AI paraphernalia are often, uh, they require metals and materials which are often extracted of in the literal sense from the global south as well and that is a conversation also we have not had in this room and uh, so I mean my concern is capital and ultimately uh, we have to uh, like if you want any kind of equity for the global south you have to challenge capital and you can't do that um, purely on standards you have to develop regulations which operate in and across nations thank you thank you we had a question here. I was going to highlight almost the same thing. Um, uh, I think it's really important that we start discussing how these technologies are going to continue to generate concentration of wealth and power in certain places, extracting it from others, and how it's creating and going to continue to create challenges for different countries that need money to tackle them and that money normally it's gathered through taxes and there's also all this problem of the global tax evasion. So all these things are really interrelated and require both, I mean, I, I don't think, I think the discussion shouldn't be national, international, regional, all of them are needed. Uh, uh, but I think this is a problem that we need to become aware and participate more in a multi-stakeholder approach because decisions are being made about how this wealth is uh, not shared uh, and that impacts in a very strong way how rights are impacted and the ability of governments to tackle the problems uh, that will arise and are arising from this inequality and this uh, concentration of wealth and power. We've got one over here and then one on the side here. Go ahead. I just uh, want, on, want to add on to the points about, you know, how do we guarantee human rights in the context of AI? I understand that very understandably there is a distrust of state overreach when it comes to state using new AI systems. But unfortunately, we haven't found a way around or outside of the nation state to guarantee rights, right? Like who will be a guarantor of rights? 
And there I also want to point right now to a process that's happening in the United Nations, which is the negotiations on the binding treaty on transnational corporations. And I think it would be very important for digital rights advocates to also be part of that process and feed into specific uh, uh, recommendations about what are the areas where we need to hold the big tech companies and the new platform companies to account and what are some very specific provisions in this regard that we should be asking for. So we also need to connect to that, I think. Very nice, thank you. Uh, Florencia, you had something? I, I also want to mention that uh, the issue uh, also has a, a capillary level uh, uh, when talking about, for example, uh, the, the right of labor, that uh, is the right with which we are working in the report. We are talking about uh, the, the, the apply of uh, this reflection in every private sector. So uh, there is every private uh, actor in every field of work that um, also is related with this discussion. So there we, uh, can also issue this this uh, uh, this aspect. Thank you. Were there any other hands in the room that I'm missing? Great. So at this point, oh, am I missing someone? Do we have a remote question? We have a remote question and answer. <laughs> so, uh, the question was about gender bias at design level of artificial intelligence and the editor, Alan, who is also online, answered that there are several examples on the book, uh, all at design level, at uh, the data used to train artificial intelligence as well, and he pointed us to the Poland example. Thanks, Rox, that's great. So, uh, at this time, I would like to invite Vidushi Marda to make a few uh, comments. So, as I said, Vidushi is with Article 19. She also wrote the introductory chapter to the thematic reports, as well as co-writing a chapter on India. Vidushi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think we have been working on artificial intelligence at Article 19 for about three years now, very sustained and specific engagement. And one of the biggest problems or shortcomings that we found in the field was that, firstly, all the governance was top down. So there were very high level frameworks that spoke about ethics and that spoke about regulation and human rights. So it was completely top down. And also that the people in the room were almost always from the US or from Europe. And uh, we have been asked at many points what the Asian perspective is and what the African perspective on a certain question is, um, and while there are great case studies from, you know, from the US and UK and Europe um, about the uses and dangers of these technologies, it was always assumed that this learning can be extrapolated onto entire continents. And this assumption that the global south is one thing, or it's a monolithic thing, or that, you know, we can apply lessons from one part of the world. Um, in a blanket fashion to the other, or that we should look at economies of scale with new technologies and make the business case for these things stronger was a huge problem for us. Um, and I think what Gizwatch does perfectly is sort of demonstrate that firstly, we needed to be bottom up. We need to ground our understanding of what these systems are in social contexts and realities within which they function. Um, and I think having, having a book like this is not just about we found this research, it's also like a toolkit, right? So the next time any of us go to a meeting where we're talking about ethical frameworks or we're talking about regulation or we're talking about the actual impact of a certain type of technology, we have a number of reports that are grounded in reality from experts in that region. And I think that is what um, this, this area of work desperately needs and this is what um, this edition does. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's been fantastic working with APC, and at this point, I'd also like to thank uh, the team at APC for bringing together this kind of really rich experience and expertise into one room, because it's incredibly rare, um, and it's incredibly difficult to do, because there's so much to say, and there's not enough deliberate attempts to understand realities on the ground. Um, and yeah, thank you, thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Vidushi.
That's fantastic. So on that note, I'd like to turn it over to chat for some closing remarks from APC. So I think the first people to thank are the authors. We've had, over the years, many, many authors. And over the years also, we, some, some of you have written several times in, um, for Giswatch, and we want to continue that. Um, so these, the authors are a community as well. So it's not only writing once, it's also creating that community that can in fact reflect together collectively on the very critical issues that we face. Now the, well, the, secondly, I wanna thank also, I don't know if there are, see the partners are still here, but I'd like to thank them for their support, um, for continuously supporting the, this publication. And the million dollar question is that, will we, what's the topic for next year? <laughs> We, we don't know that, but we are, <laughs> we don't know that yet, but you're welcome. Please, if you have an idea, if there is any, you know, uh, really pressing critical issue that you feel that the community needs, then please come to us. We will have discussions about it. Um, the other, I, I, that's one, but before that also, I, I just also want to say to uh, um, second what people have said, that this is not, it doesn't finish here, the publication, yeah? I hope that we will bring it back, we will use it, and we want to hear from you about how it's used, because it's also for us a learning, you know, this is also how we learn, so that we can make it a more effective advocacy tool. And of course, I'd like to thank this is like a love fest here going on here, but thank you for Article 19 and thank you to also to the APC team and to everyone who contributed to this, uh, to this edition. And lastly, we, we are having a party tonight. <laughs> if, if you haven't been to an APC party before, then come tonight. Yeah, and it's, you will find it at that out. Does anybody know where it is happening? <laughs> And what time? At our, booth. at our booth. That's right. This is a way to get you to our booth. Come to our booth. You'll find out where to party tonight. No work, we promise. Just fun. <laughs>